Christina Davis, Director of the Program on U.S.-Japan Relations at Harvard University. I'm delighted to welcome you all for a seminar on how per pork barrel politics holds Japan's governing coalition together. Amy Katalinik, Assistant Professor of Politics at New York University, is going to be our speaker. And this is a particular moment where many of us are paying attention to American politics. In fact, we have been obsessively following American politics because tomorrow is a very big election day. But at the same time, it is useful and reassuring to look at how different electoral systems and political coordination works in Japan. And we're delighted to have Amy Katalinik here to help us understand how electoral politics works or fall short in a Japanese context. And we are fortunate to have her here because she is one of the leading experts on Japanese politics. So if you have anything you want to know about how electoral systems work, Amy will have answers. And she has been uh, studying Japanese politics since coming to Harvard and as a graduate student where she received her PhD degree. And her uh, academic work as a graduate student was excellent, received an Akiyama Prize from the program on US-Japan relations. And she became professor at NYU in 2016 after having been a postdoctoral fellow in our Harvard program on US-Japan relations. So we can claim some credit for her successes. She has already published a book on electoral reform, national security in Japan. This is an incredible project that looks through all of the campaign manifesto promises of Japanese politicians to look at how they change and shape policy. She has also published in leading journals, the American Political Science Review article on electoral systems, and also looking at pork or policy in a article in the Journal of Politics. Amy, on the side of all of this research, is also a parent of two young children and just moved this weekend. So we are incredibly fortunate that in this busy life, she would join us to share her research. Thank you very much. And before we turn over to Amy, I want to introduce next week, we will have Michael Green discussing Japan's strategy in Asia. And finally, we have our Zoom etiquette. It is important that we all keep our uh, microphones muted and you may ask a question in chat, or you may wait for the end of the talk and raise a virtual hand in the participants button and we can call on individuals at the end of the talk. Thank you very much. You're muted, Amy. Uh, thank you so much, Christina, for that uh, very gracious, lovely introduction, and to the US Japan program for having me back. I had a wonderful year there uh, several years ago, always looking for a reason to go back to Cambridge. Um, I guess now it's virtual, but anyway, so thank you so much. So I'm going to get started. So today's talk is called How Pork Barrel Politics Holds Japan's Governing Coalition Together. First, I want to start by mentioning the puzzle that drives this project and some of my, my recent projects. So since 1955, Japanese politics has been dominated by the Liberal Democratic Party. And I don't need to share this information with you, but perhaps it may sort of help to reinforce how puzzling this is. So the LDP has won a plurality in lower house elections in 20 of the past 21 lower house elections. That has placed it in government for 61 of the past 65 years. In seven of those 21 elections, including four recent elections, it won more than 60% of seats in these elections. So this dominance is highly unusual in a democracy. Since 1999, all of you will know that the LDP has been in government in a coalition government with a smaller party called the Kuomeito. Now, this coalition is a puzzle. I'm going to give you three reasons why it's a puzzle. The first is that the two parties are ideologically incompatible. So the LDP 
Uh, it's a conservative nationalist party. Uh, it's sort of founded on this goal of unshackling Japan from these allied era, these allied occupation era reforms. It wants to revise the constitution. It wants to carve out a, a more equal relationship with the United States. The Kuomeito, on the other hand, formed in 1964, has a platform of pacifism, social welfare, and humanistic socialism. So the Kuomeito is opposed to constitution revision and opposed to an independent security policy for Japan. So the two parties are unlikely bedfellows. It's not that common across the world to observe coalitions among parties that are ideologically incompatible. Also, the two parties have a history of antagonism. Prior to 1999, LDP candidates would regularly contest elections, saying things like, the enemy is Kome. So the two parties did not like each other. And the third reason this is a puzzle is that in some of these elections, the LDP won enough seats to govern on its own, specifically 2005, 2012, 2014, 2017 elections. The LDP won more than 60% of the seats. It did not need the support provided by the Kuomeito, especially in the latter period in which it also would have been able to have a majority in the House of Councillors. What we want to know is why these two parties are so tight, what each partner gets from the coalition, what role, if any, has the coalition played in helping the LDP win elections in Japan, and what takeaways there are, if any, for other countries. So I'm a political scientist, and I'm interested in Japanese politics as a lens through which we can understand political problems and institutions that, that are common across the world. Okay, in today's talk, there's gonna, it's gonna have the following format. First, I'm going to explain how Japan's electoral system gives the LDP incentives to engage in pre-electoral coordination with the Kuomeito. So this is Senkyo Kyoryoko in Japanese. They engage in coordination with the Kuomeito and they have incentives to try and cement this coordination with government spending. And I'm going to explain how they do that. Then I'm going to present evidence that they're doing this from Japan's House of Representatives elections in this period. And then finally, I'm going to discuss the implications for LDP dominance, for intra-coalition politics, and other puzzles about Japanese politics. So first, and so first, I, I will say that this, the work I'm presenting today is drawn from a co-authored project with a PhD candidate in my department here in NYU politics. Her name is Lucia Motolinia. She's absolutely fantastic. Her specialty is Mexico, Mexican politics. Mine is Japanese politics. So the paper actually looks at Japan and Mexico, and we're hoping to expand this into a book, include other cases of, of the, the same countries with the same electoral system. So Japan's House of Representatives, since this is the lower house, the Shugin. So since 1996, this has used a mixed member electoral system. Now mixed member systems are increasingly common around the world. 38 countries around the world today use what's called a mixed member electoral system. So by our calculations, we calculated that 33% of voters in democracies all over the world go to the polls and elect their lower houses, which are the more powerful houses in almost every case, according to a mixed member system. So this system, very common, we want to know more about this system. So what is a mixed member electoral system? So typically, they, they almost always, they have two tiers. One is a district tier. The district tier is comprised of single seat districts, to use the kind of current terminology in comparative politics, single seat districts in Japanese is shosenkyoko. So it's a single seat, one winner emerges from the district. And the second tier is a proportional representation tier. So this is hirei daihyo in Japanese. And it's not always closed list, um, but this is typically, it's typically the two tiers are a district tier and a proportional representation tier. Now, Within these 38 countries using mixed member systems, there are two types of system. Japan's type is called mixed member majoritarian. Now this is a critical, I'm gonna explain what, what a mixed member majoritarian system is. 
This is called, I'm going to call this, by the way, MMM. Okay, so MMM. So MMM is actually used in 30 countries around the world. It's really common. It's the most common type of mixed system. In many countries in East Asia and Asia more generally that use MMM. So in MMM, voters cast vote, a vote for a candidate in the district race and a vote for the, a party in a PR race. They don't always have two ballots. Sometimes they have one ballot, but usually they have two ballots. So we all, many people here, um, I, I assume are Japanese nationals and would have voted. So you have two votes. You vote for your candidate in your district and you vote for your party in proportional representation. Now, this is the critical feature of how it differs from the other type of electoral system. So under MMM, the number of seats a party wins is the sum of the number of seats it wins in both tiers. So if you're a party, you have to win the number of, the number of districts you win are added to the number of seats you win in PR. So what that means is you can't ignore one of the tiers. You have to win seats in both tiers. Now this is critically, this is different from the other type of mixed member system that we are actually are more familiar with in political science, which is called mixed member proportional. So that's used in my native country, New Zealand. Um, so in that system, the total number of seats a party wins comes from those it wins in the PR tier. So in those systems, it doesn't matter, you don't have to concentrate on winning in the districts. But in Japan's case under MMN, you have to win a majority seeking party that wants a, major wants a majority has to win as many districts as possible and as many PR seats as possible. Okay, so let's just talk about the fundamentals, uh, sort of bread and butter of electoral systems. So in a single seat district, a sure senkyoku, we all know that the candidate capturing the most votes wins and all the votes cast for the losing candidates are wasted. So in this situation, Competition is usually between two serious competitors. So in a district, you typically have two competitors. For a while in Japan, it was Jiminto or Minshito. Uh, now it's a little unclear, but competition is usually between two serious competitors. And the conventional wisdom holds that voters don't want to waste their vote. So small parties are going to be, they're not going to be viable in a single seat district because you have to win the most votes. You have to place first. And so small parties struggle to place first, so they're not going to be running. This is sort of the, the, the fundamental theory of electoral systems uh, attributed to Downs. So in a single seat district, two competitors. The situation PR is very different. This is critical to understand this. So in the PR tier, the number of seats a party wins increases with its vote share. So there's no threshold after which votes for losing candidates are wasted. So in the PR tier, the proportional representation tier, both large and small parties can be viable. If you're a small party and you can get 5% of the votes, then you're probably, you're going to be viable and you can get seats. So why pre-electoral coordination? So why would parties want to coordinate with other parties under this system? So under MMM, we make the case that large parties have reason to coordinate with smaller parties. Why? So the large party needs to place first in a majority of single seat districts. Okay, but the problem, especially for the LDP, is it has some candidates that are just not strong enough, right? So maybe it has candidates that can get 35% of the votes in a district, but not 50%. And the LDP particularly, it came from an older electoral system where its, its candidates, frankly, they didn't have to be that popular. They just had to win a small proportion of the votes in a, in a district in order to win a seat. So this is the problem. It needs to win a majority of districts, doesn't always have strong candidates. What is it going to do? So in districts where its candidates are weak, what it can do is ask a small party to stand down, to not run a candidate, kōhōta tatenei, they can not run a candidate, and ask its supporters to vote for the large party's candidate. So a large party that candidate that's a little bit weak, if, if that candidate can negotiate some kind of deal like that, then they can get enough votes to put themselves over the finish line. 
Now, under MMN, what the large party can do is they can sweeten the deal by asking the large party supporters to vote for the small party in PR. So what's going on is there is a switch in votes. The large party's candidate can say, okay, you guys don't run your candidate and get your supporters to vote for me. And in exchange, I'm gonna ask my supporters to, to vote for you in PR. So what parties can do is by doing this, both parties can win more seats than they otherwise would. So the, the large party can win more single seat districts, which is critical to forming a majority, and the small party can get more PR seats. So concretely, what happens in the case of Japan and the, the LDP and the Kuomeito? So since they formed the coalition, it took a couple of elections for this to get established. But what they do is they divvy up, they divide all the SSDs. So there's 300, there were 300 SSDs. They divide them up into LDP SSDs and Kuomeito SSDs. So in LDP SSDs, this is like a district with an LDP candidate. The Kuomeito candidate does not run. There, Kuomeito supporters are asked to cast their district votes for the LDP candidate and LDP supporters are asked to cast their PR votes for the Kuomeito. So the, in exchange for standing down, the Kuomeito candidate does not run. In exchange for standing down, they get the votes of LDP supporters in PR. And this helps the LDP candidate win the election, win the district. The reverse happens in Kuomeito SSDs. So in Kuomeito SSDs, the LDP candidate is not running and the LDP supporters are asked to cast their district votes for the Kuomeito candidate and Kuomeito supporters are asked to cast their PR votes for the LDP. So the switch is in reverse when the, when the LDP candidate is standing down. When the LDP candidate is standing down, the LDP wants PR votes. When the Kuomeito candidate is standing down, Kuomeito wants PR votes. So this is what we think is going on. Now, this claim is not unique to me. Other scholars have made this claim as well. The LDP wins more SSDs, Kuomeito wins more PR seats than they otherwise would. But what is the sort of value added of our study? As we sat down and we thought, hmm, there's a large literature in political science that illustrates how governing parties can use government spending, geographically targeted spending, to increase their chances of staying in office. There's a very large literature on this in comparative politics. So we thought, could governing parties, the LDP and the Kuomeito, could they be using this money to encourage supporters to help them coordinate? And we thought, okay, if you're an incumbent, like if you're an incumbent LDP politician in your district, how would you go about trying to encourage voters, encourage your supporters to switch their votes? Remember that you, you don't want your supporters to vote for you in PR. You want your supporters to switch the PR votes to the Kuomeito. Now, the problem is Japan is a democracy. Like many other democracies, there's the secret ballot. So you can't observe if an individual is voting for the LDP's candidate and then the Kuomeito in PR. You can't observe how individuals vote. But it turns out that in many democracies around the world, votes are counted at a geographic unit within each district. So in many countries, they, the votes are counted at the polling station level. So in New Zealand, it's actually it's counted at the polling station level. Um, my mother lives in a very tiny part. I think they only count 120 votes at the polling box in her like little area. So when you, and the point is, you can, if you're an incumbent politician and you have a district, and there are 20, say, say there are 20 municipalities in your district and uh, votes are counted at the level of the municipality, then you can observe how each unit is voting. So what we thought was an incumbent politician could, could use changes in votes over time to try and work out whether their supporters are switching their votes in the manner that they are supposed to be switching. So this is sort of our... Um, and once, so the idea that we were thinking is that they, they could look to see whether their changes in votes indicates switching, and then they could use uh, the geographical, geographically targeted money that they control to try and reward places that comply where there's more switching and penalize places 
that don't comply in order to encourage supporters to comply. So concretely, there are a number of reasons why this, this hypothesis is very plausible in the Japanese case. So in Japan, unusually so, municipalities are very dependent on the central government for the revenue to perform basic services. So the average municipality in Japan depends on the central government for about 60% of its income. So there are a couple of different types of government transfers. One is called koko shishitsuken, national treasury disbursements. So this is an enormous pool of money that the government makes available and municipalities can apply for this to fund projects in the municipality. So helpfully in Japanese elections, votes are counted at the level of the municipality. In districts, SSDs in Japan, electoral districts, are almost perfectly divided into municipalities. So if you have, and then the number, there are a very, very small number of municipalities that span more than one district, but overall it's like perfectly divided. So politicians can look at their district and they say there's 20 different municipalities, they can look at their vote share, changes in vote shares across the municipalities, and then they can like target this money, this koko shishitsuken, at these municipalities. And other research, a paper that I, that I published last year and other work by Jun Saito shows that this particular fund, National Treasury Disbursements, has been used to reward and incentivize particular voting patterns in Japanese elections. So the hypothesis that we want to test that we wanted to test is if we're correct and the government is using money to encourage voters, supporters of both parties to switch their votes, then we should observe municipalities in LDP SSDs receiving more money after elections when they increase PR votes for the Kormato and decrease them for the LDP. In Kormato SSDs, it's the opposite. We observe, we should expect municipalities to receive more money after elections when they increase PR votes for the LDP and decrease them for the Kormato. So this is how electoral coordination, difficult to observe, but this is how we think an incumbent might think about, this is how we think they would be observing whether this was happening. So to examine this hypothesis, I put together, we put together a huge uh, data set um, I, my data set is, is very large, it's 25 years worth of municipality level funding, lots of variables associated with the municipality, including voting behavior. And I think um, someone who helped me a lot, Shiro Kuriwaki, is, is listening today, so I'm happy he, he knows the trial. This data set took years to put together. Um, so what we decided to do, and my co-author was responsible for the data on Mexico, so I was responsible for the Japanese data, so what we did is we did a two-way, it's called a two-way fixed effect regression of transfers the year following these elections as a function of, of these variables, right? So we want to explain transfers. Transfers is koko shishitsuken. And we want to explain per capita transfers, the amount of money a municipality gets after the election. We think that's being influenced by their electoral coordination, their behavior in the election. So to measure that, we have the following variables. So this variable is delta Kormato PR vote share. This is just the change in share of eligible voters in the municipality who voted for the Kormato relative to the previous election. This just, so increases in this mean more PR votes for the Kormato. And then we did the same variable for the LDP, but we multiplied it by negative one. So this is the same, this is sort of a mirror image. So on, in more higher scores of delta Kormator PR vote share mean more PR votes for the Kormator, but higher scores in this mean fewer votes for the LDP. And the reason we operationalize the variables in this way is that we are interested in the, in the coefficient on this interaction between these two variables. So if you interact these two variables, it captures the effect of a municipality that increases PR votes for the Kormato and decreases them for the LDP. So we expect in LDP SSDs, the coefficient on this variable is going to be positive and significant. That would mean that municipalities that increase PR votes for the Kormato while decreasing them for the LDP 
get more money after the election. So we're interested in the effects on this, of this, the coefficient on this interaction. We have a lot of controls. We thought through, we spent a lot of time working out the specification here. So the first control we have that I want to mention is we have a control, an SSD year fixed effect. So what we're doing is we are controlling for ways in which the district in a particular year might differ from other districts in particular years. So you, you know, some in some districts, you know, there might be a winner from the LDP. Other districts, the person might lose. Um, there are lots of ways in which districts differ from each other. So when we include this fixed effect, it means we are only comparing municipalities that are within the same district from each other. We also include what's called a municipality fixed effect. So that controls for all these ways in which municipalities might be different from each other. So some municipalities might be really good at applying for money from the central government or building a consensus in the community around like which project to seek funding for. So we control for all of that. We control for municipality level controls, like there are things like income shocks, something could happen and municipality suddenly gets a lot more money, per capita income rises, maybe that's driving the results. We wanna control for all those things. We also control for the, de the lagged dependent variable, transfers the year of the election. So that control, that sort of guards against the possibility that maybe something is, so something is driving both the municipality to get more transfers and the municipality to exhibit greater compliance with coordination. And that's something that we don't observe is, is actually driving the results. So this helps to control for that. And we also include changes in vote share uh, for the coalition's SSD candidate. Because remember, we're interested in um, the effects of switching your PR votes, and we wanna make sure that any effect of that is not being driven by a change in support for the SSD candidate. So this is, this is a table, like a big table. So the key takeaway is up here, the coefficient on the interaction is positive and statistically significant across all specifications. So this looks at LDP SSDs. So in LDP SSDs, we have an LDP candidate running, Cormator candidate is standing down. This shows that places that increase PR votes for the Cormator and decrease them for the LDP get more money after the election. And this is just a marginal effects plot. If you look um, at, this is the effect on transfers at different levels of support for the, for the Cormator. So if you look at the black dotted line, you can see that it's sloping upwards. So what this means is, as votes for the LDP decrease in a municipality where votes for the Cormator have increased, you get more money after the election. And next, I'm gonna talk about this again in a second. Next, we look at Cormator SSDs. Now this, you see up here, the effect on the co coefficient is the opposite, which is what we expect. So it's negative. So in Cormator SSDs, where the LDP candidate has stood down deliberately, therefore the LDP candidate expects that the LDP is going to get more PR votes, places that increase PR votes for the Cormator and decrease them for the LDP are punished. They're penalized with less money after the election. So this is a remarkable result because we only have 63 observations and we have all of these controls and we have SSD year fixed effects. This is just very striking evidence uh, in support of our hypothesis. Just to highlight what happens in Cormator SSDs, if you look at the black dotted line again, it's sloping downwards. So what this means is the effect on transfers is negative. So as you decreases in votes for the LDP, in places where the Cormator vote share has increased are penalized. So just to go back two slides, it's positive, the black dotted line is positive in LDP SSDs and negative in Cormator SSDs, which is exactly what the theory expects. Okay, so what have we learned? What we've learned is that Japan's governing coalition is using pork barreling to help it win elections. In LDP SSDs, money is being used to convince LDP supporters to switch their PR votes to the Cormator. In Cormator SSDs, 
money is being used to convince Cormator supporters to switch their PR votes to the LDP. Further, looking at the, the coefficients on the uninteracted variables tell us other interesting things. Okay, so in LDP SSDs, money is not being used to convince Cormator supporters to cast more PR votes for the Cormator. Right, so in Cormator SSDs, the deal is for standing down, Cormator gets PR votes. They want PR votes. But what we observe in the results is that the coalition is paying LDP supporters who switch their votes. They're not paying Cormator supporters to try and mobilize more votes. In Cormator SSDs, money is being used to convince LDP supporters to cast more PR votes for the LDP. So the point is LDP supporters are getting money in all types of SSDs to do whatever the governing coalition wants them to do. But Cormator supporters are only getting money in the Cormator SSDs for switching their votes, their PR votes, for the, to the LDP. But the amount they get for doing that is huge. Okay, so takeaways for Japan scholars. The LDP is not as strong as it looks. Okay, so the Cormator only has 9 to 11% of seats. So on it, you look at the seat shares of the two parties and you're like, oh, Cormator only contributes, you know, this many seats. It's not as powerful. But the point is that many LDP candidates would not get elected without these Cormator votes. So the LDP is not kind of winning all of these seats by itself. It's using the voters of the Cormator to help them do so. So as political scientists who work on Japan, we shouldn't rely on the number of SSDs won by the LDP or like the number of PR votes won by the Cormator to gauge the electoral strength of either party. And this is likely the case in other mixed systems too, where there's electoral coordination going on. So it's just, it's just con it's contaminated. This is a word that electoral system scholars use. The votes, um, the votes cast in the district tier and the votes cast in the PR tier for different parties are contaminated with the supporters of other parties. So the combination of Japan's current electoral system, MMM, and the ability to use this money that, uh, that the LDP, gov that the government controls, is enabling the LDP to use the Cormator as a crutch to help it win, to help it win these, these huge majorities. So this is a new explanation for why opposition parties are struggling to unseat the government in Japan. So unfortunately, MMM is not the only electoral system that enables uh, the government to use money in ways that help it prolong its stay in, in government. There's lots of different, different electoral systems enable the government to do that. But I do want to look at, I want to try and compare MMM with other electoral systems in terms of which makes it harder uh, for the government to be, for opposition parties to unseat the government based on the crafty, sneaky ways in which the governing party can use, can use the spending. So I, I just did this, uh, I just want to say that something I want to work on, I, did, I tried to do this party tree of all of the different parties in Japan. And I, I, to be honest, I, had, I, I asked uh, somebody, my, uh, I had a research assistant who helped me do this, who did a lot of this like, organization, was so difficult. But I, my suspicion is that there is all of these parties over here um, to the right, uh, right hand side. And this is sort of what's going on with the opposition in Japan. Now, I, my suspicion is that some of these parties have been formed, were formed, not with, the, and this, I have no evidence of this. This is just something I want to look at more for the book. I think a lot of these parties are not forming to try and become another DPJ and unseat the LDP. I think some of these parties are forming to unseat the Cormator as the LDP's coalition partner. Because if they can do that, then they can get in government and they can become supportive of the LDP and they can get things for their people. So I just wanted to kind of say that it sort of might make sense of the problems the opposition are having uh, at the moment to coordinate. General takeaways. MMM makes pre-electoral coordination desirable and possible. When governing parties reliant on coordination have access to geographically targeted funds, they're likely to be tempted to use those funds to try and cement the coordination. And if they do, opposition parties may be severely and systematically disadvantaged disadvantaged in these systems. So what's next? So I want to look at whether governing parties 
are doing this in other countries using MMM. There are 28 other countries. We look at Japan and Mexico. We want to look at the other 28 countries too. We want to look at how MMM stacks up against other electoral systems and the advantages that it confers on ruling parties. We want to look at why coordination does not always work. And lastly, this is what I'm very excited about this last, uh, this, this something that this last sort of bullet point that I have here. So I want to look at how these payments impact negotiations over policy within the coalition. So within the coalition, the LDP and the Kuomintang are always bargaining over things. Like recently, they're bargaining over when the election should be held. They're bargaining over the COVID-related handouts uh, back in April. They bargain over security policy. The LDP managed to get rid of the um, interpretation, overturn the interpretation that Japan was not allowed to exercise, exercise collective self-defense. It, it's possible that the LDP is using this money to buy the Kuomintang's support for policies that the Kuomintang doesn't like. And I, I'm really excited about that aspect of this research agenda. So for now, I will conclude and say thank you. Um, please uh, feel free to look me up or my co-author up. Really fantastic co-author. Um, she's just got a lot of exciting research on her own and she also has two papers with me. So um, we look forward to your comments and thank you so much for, for listening to the talk. Thank you very much, Amy. You have taken a very complex election system and made it simple and easy for us to understand, which I appreciate Perfect. greatly. And you've also shown a great example of using detailed data to help test sneaky politicians and shed light on an interesting case of coordination that helps explain what we've all been thinking about. How can the LDP remain in power for so long? So it's a very interesting presentation. Thank you. We now have two lead off questions from academic associates with the US Japan program. Professor Kubo of the University of the Ryukyus will ask the first question. Can you hear me? Yeah. Thank you for introduction. And I appreciate a fantastic talk, Professor Katarina. I think the finding that MMM causes pork barry politics is critically important for Japan uh, academically and socially because MMM was a result of political reform for removing pork barry politics under former LDP dominancy. Regarding this point, let me ask an external but substantive question. Uh, does the evidence that a different form of pork barrel politics in post electoral reform indicates a change in Japan's underlying political structure based on local electoral system or its continuum, which is. Thank you so much again. Yeah, so this is a critical question and people who know my previous work will be, will understand how critical this question is for me to answer. Um, so thank you for this question. So I, I think that um, the LDP is just, it, no, it has, it fine tuned its ability. So, so under the old electoral system Japan had prior to 1996, every politician was sort of ruler of their own fife. And it was a mad scramble for resources. All of the politicians affiliated with the party or wanting to be affiliated with the party spent a lot of time trying to get pork barrel uh, projects for their communities. After electoral reform, um, this new system came into place and they had these skills at getting uh, pork for their communities. And I think they were able, they've been able to refine the use of pork uh, and target it to get Kormato supporters to switch their votes and LDP supporters to switch their votes. So I think overall, I haven't looked at the amounts of pork. I think the amounts of like the amounts of pork have gone down. And the way, but the the actual use of pork has become more targeted at the supporters of both parties. So the LDP now has sort of two two types of electoral strategies. One is public facing, median voter, floating voter facing, and that is sort of programmatic policies. But then it's using the pork in sneaky ways 
to, to enable it to get a few more votes where it needs to on the margins. But that pork is not, the difference from before is before under the old electoral system, the pork was sort of targeted at every, every voter, every municipality. Whereas now they have this nice uh, public facing programmatic policy, um, social welfare, security policy, education, uh, which they use to get floating voters and it's not always been very successful, frankly. Um, but, and then they use this pork, they target it at their supporters and the Cormator supporters to, um, so I think the use of pork has changed and overall it's gone down a lot, but it's become more efficient use of pork. And next we have a question from Dr. Park of Osaka University. Oh, thank you, Amy. Okay. As you may know, Osaka is a very important region, especially for Kometo. Yesterday in Osaka, there was a big political event related to Osaka Tokoso. So it was supported by Kometo, but opposed by LDP. So my question is, do you think your logic or your hypothesis still work for local politics or subnational level in Japan? Well, why or why not? There are lots of individual cases that I, like I think there's a lot of bargaining going on between the two parties. Like the way the Kometo decided to support this, like at the last minute, like, like the same with the, um, what was I just, yeah, like Quaker's party, the Tomin First party she started um, and the Kometo, she got the support of the Kometo and the Metro, Tokyo Metropolitan Assembly over the wishes of the LDP. So I, I think this, you know, what I'm studying here is the beginning of a lot of work that could be done on the bargaining mm -hmm. between the two parties. Like I think sometimes I, I have a lot of, you know, hypotheses that I don't have evidence for yet, but sometimes the core motto is like, we, we really don't want this. And they're trying to get something. So when the LDP does it, they're trying to get it watered down or they're trying to show that they've gone on record opposing something. So the LDP will um, give them something. Like, I think there's just a lot of bargaining. And so in individual cases, I don't know, but I think you could look at spending and how that correlates with sort of the unpalatability of the policies the LDP is getting past the Cormato. So around the time of the constitutional reinterpretation of the ban on collective security, it's possible spending went up to get the Cormato to agree to that. But also Abe himself, I think, watered that down substantially from what he originally wanted. So in 2012, when the LDP was in opposition before they came back, they, the LDP passed that manifesto or they issued a manifesto saying, you know, we want a wholesale revision of article, we want this article nine this to be revised and issued like incredibly strident um, demands. And then they ended up being watered down by the Cometo. So I, I don't have a good sense of individual cases and like the dynamics here, but I do think spending may be related. So I want to study that in the future. Thank you for your question though. Thank you. And Susan Farr has a question. Thank you, Amy. That was really a, such a clear and fascinating presentation. Can you take us down, however, to the level of the individual voter? And it seems appropriate to do that on the eve of an election where in the state of Maine, there are some people who uh, hate Susan Collins, this senator. Other people love Susan Collins. People have passions. They have passions for candidates. So at the individual level, what is the candidate? Say I'm a, a CG, I'm a Cometo supporter and I love my candidate, but my candidate is, what is that candidate telling me? He's telling me to vote for me, but to, when it comes to the party vote, to vote for the LDP, a party that I really may actually hate. So how does this, and you're saying that I should do this because of, of some transfers that are happening to the municipality. And so that's kind of my question, but I also want to throw in to the extent that this works, how much is it true in the case of Komato that the connection with Soka Gakkai is one of the factors that gets CDP voters to go along with it? Yeah, so the Soka Gakkai, 
-hmm. is that's traditionally like one of the the sort of very loyal groups of supporters mm -hmm. attached to Kormato candidates. Mm -hmm. uh, one, that's one reason why Kormato is a very nice partner to have if you're interested in, um, in, in getting someone to help support you. Because, so the Kormato actually have a history of electoral coordination. They coordinated with the Minshat or the DSP prior to the electoral reform. And in the LDP, Ozawa and LDP made a lot of, uh, Ozawa first and then the LDP, made a lot of effort to try and get the Kormato into the coalition government that the LDP had in the late 1990s because the voters are so attached because of the Soka Gakkai. So I, I can't say whether like whether um, the same outcome, it's difficult to say if it wasn't the Soka Gakkai voters, if they weren't a religious sort of uh, lay Buddhist sect, if they were non-religious, would they, would they have been an, as attractive a coalition partner for the LDP? Um, I, I can't, it's difficult to say that, um, but to answer, that's the second half of your question. The first part is about the voters. And I think this is working through supporters, not voters. So it's the supporters of both parties. And those supporters we know in the case of the LDP, so in the case of the Komeito, the Sokagakai members for the most part, in the case of the LDP, they are people who are attached to individual LDP politicians through the Kōenkai, and they get kind of passed along. Now, if you're a supporter of the LDP, you don't want to split your vote for the Kōmeto, is what you're alluding to. So you might just hate the party. You don't want to cast your PR vote for the party. But remember that it's actually helping your party get in. So it's helping your party govern if you do so. So you might think about the, the amount of transfers being adjusted. So if, if the hatred of the other party is intense, maybe you need to get more money. The government, the governing LDP needs to offer you more money to switch your vote. If you didn't hate the party so much, it could be less money. So that I, I think that factors in to how to, to how much um, like how, how much money can be adjusted. That's why money is so useful. That gets me to the point that I alluded to in the presentation whereby it is kind of hard to get people to switch their votes. Money is useful. The opposition parties don't have access to money because they're not in power. So they have this, they're very disadvantaged. Opposition parties have compelling reasons to coordinate. If they coordinated, they could unseat the LDP, but they don't have the glue, we argue, to make the coordination stick because they don't have these huge resources of money that the uh, governing, governing coalition has. Mark Mannion. Thanks, Christina, and uh, thanks for a great talk, Amy. Um, uh, this is gonna kind of follow on um, Sung Jung Park and, uh, and Susan Farr's question of sort of getting down to the local level. And forgive me if you've answered this already, but um, I'm wondering if you could talk about, like kind of open the box and on um, what the mechanisms are by which uh, Komeito and perhaps Sokogakai, um, their local chapters uh, would benefit from these uh, transfer payments. Because after all, you know, to my knowledge, uh, Komeito, I mean, it doesn't control any prefectural governorships um, and it has a relatively small share of prefectural assemblies. Um, so. So, you know, I, I get the, the picture that the, the funds are going, but, but how does that benefit the local chapters uh, and sort of reward them for transferring their votes? So that's an aspect of the project that I'd like to get more into. So, in, so that's probably explains why in all types of SSDs, the LDP supporters, so the LDP we know controls almost all local, local, um, you know, political assembly, local assemblies, local mayorships, et cetera, but the Kormator doesn't. So there's obviously a pipeline there, and this is a case that Ethan Shiner has made in his, in his work. So that could explain why the money is always, money is always targeted toward LDP supporters. And that, and that could be because the LDP supporters are organized around these local assembly members and local uh, mayors and cities, and they are so dependent on the central government for funding to do like everything they want. So that could explain why the Kormato supporters, at least in the LDP SSDs, aren't getting, the money doesn't seem to be going to places where to try and mobilize Kormato PR votes that are not LDP supporters switching their votes. So, but I guess in the Kormato SSDs, 
the candidate is from the Cormato and they are influencing the ways of the projects, I guess, the, the structure of the project that are, they, they are going to be the ones in areas of, so the, the funding can be used in different areas. One of those areas is social welfare and education facilities. So if that's, you know, if we agree that that's an area where Cormato has strength, then maybe in those Cormato SSDs, the pattern of funds looks, looks a bit different. And I could look at that to see whether the um, money is going to, if it's got more of a Cormato flavor in those places. Um, I hope that. But actually, this on this point, can I just say, I just thought about something else I wanted to say. It is a critical question that Susan raised about um, the religious underpinnings like of the Soka Gakkai supporters. And what, I, and what I would say in response to that is that we looked at this in Mexico as well. And the, in Mexico, it's not a religious party. The small party is called the Ecological Green Party of Mexico. And we, we observe the same patterns of large party getting the small party to switch their votes. And so the, and the small party in that case does not have a vaunted history of loyal vote uh, sort of mobilizers in elections. So I think that makes the claim more general beyond Japan and not just specific to, you know, the fact that the Soka Kakai is incredibly well organized. Hans Lee Giuliano. Hello, good evening. Uh, so the question is really uh, on the moving forward of the project. So the literature usually attributes the LDP machine learning to longevity, but it leads to believe that there are results and share the level of the security that is selected much like other guarantees to the flawed democracies. And while there have been rare, rare instances of these machinery failing, um, the DPJ was able to either appropriate or eliminate it. So considering electoral reform has not succeeded in stemming this norm, and there seems to be no clear civil society effort to combat it, where would you say opposition opportunities can spring from? Also, as a side comment to your research, are you planning on incorporating Southeast Asian countries for to this study because um, they definitely have more issues as well, especially us here in the Philippines. Um, I'm just interested. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so sorry, but I missed a lot of the first part. I just got the question at the end about the Southeast Asian cases. Um, I'm sorry to ask you, would you be able to maybe type it and we could, or, or if someone wants to ask me what wants to jump in? Uh, I'll put, um, put it in the chat. I do apologize. Thank you. Oh, I see. Yes. So to summarize briefly, the question of how DPJ failure happened, was this a failure of the coordination? Yeah, so first of all, why did the LDP Cormato coordination fail in 2009? That's a critical question for us that we, we want to look at in more detail, what happened prior to 2009. Um, but the DPJ itself, why was it unable to replicate the LDP strategy? I think there were, there were some cases cases in after the DPJ came to power. There's some evidence that they kind of were interested in weaning the Kwame Tola away from the LDPs, that they could vote for them, um, but they quickly abandoned that. Um, but I think, so I think both of those questions are critical for us and I don't have much to say on them as of now. I, I have to look at them, look at them more. And the Philippines and other areas in East Asia, South Korea, uh, Taiwan, Thailand, Philippines. Yeah, I want to look at these countries. And I'm, I'm interested in South Korea because South Korea apparently switched from, uh, had MMM with two ballots, I believe, and it switched two ballots to one ballot. And in the Japanese case, we have two, two votes being cast by voters. But in Mexico, we have one ballot. So what we show in the Mexican case is even when there's only one vote, the parties can come up with a way of dividing the vote into two components, one that can be cast for one party, the other can be cast for the other party, which is really interesting. So if the Philippines had anything interesting, any changes like that, I'd love to add Philippines as a case. Thank you. We're close to the end of our time, but I cannot resist asking a last question. Pork barrel politics has often also been about agricultural subsidies. 
Yes. And literal helping the pork farmers, whether protection or subsidies. And I am curious, do the national treasury disbursements you're talking about include agriculture? Or is that an entirely different pathway for geographically targeted subsidies? And should your analysis take into account that many of the districts that do not have any coordination with Cometo because generally Cometo is not a strong presence in the largely rural prefectures. Yeah. Those operate by a different type of geographically targeted subsidy. And how have you thought about these two different um, pathways of rewarding supporters? So we think there's a lot of different pathways and this is one of them. I have another paper uh, that shows that whether, if, as a municipality, whether you end up in a PR block, there's 11 PR blocks in Japan, whether you end up in a PR block that's marginal for the LDP, you get more money after the election. There's also, money is also being used to, uh, the same funds uh, are also being used to increase vote shares for the candidates in the districts. So that's just three pathways right there that we have evidence of and, and work that I'm that I'm working on. So we think there's a lot of different things and portraying this sort of this mosaic of how spending this one fund is being used is uh, what I'm working on in my in my second book. Um, but the agriculture subsidies that we typically think of are separate. However, as a municipality, you can apply for NTD this fund to fund any project in your district essentially. So if you have an agriculture related project in your district, you can apply for funds, this fund, uh, for it as well. But this is not, because this is municipality focused funding, it's not like a subsidy or like a fund that all farmers have access to around the country. Um, but so I hope that makes sense. Over the last 15 to 20 years, there is a breakdown of this fund that we're studying. There's a breakdown by sector. And I think they have an agricultural sector breakdown. So some of this money is being used uh, to fund projects for farmers that are, that are unique to the municipality. Excellent, thank you. Thank you so very much for this broad uh, conversation about how Japanese electoral politics and intra-party cooperation can take place. I would want to ask you to connect and maybe make a prediction for the US election, but I'll spare Eesh. that. <laughs> it has actually been a real pleasure to sort of step outside of American politics for an hour. And thank you for sharing your exciting research. Look forward to hearing about the book and um, appreciate your talk today. Yeah, thank you so much everyone for signing in. It's great and, and really good questions. I, I had a lot to think about, so thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.